You're listening to the Sports Cycle on 1051 Live. I'm your host, Tim McCain, and we have a very special guest today, Tommy Kazi. How you doing today, sir? Doing well. How about yourself? Doing well, doing well. So, um, you're a professional fighter. You're one and no, but there's a pandemic going on. So, like, as a fighter, what is life like during this pandemic? Uh, life is day by day. Uh, you know, you just have to wait and see what the next day is going to hold. You know, here lately, you know, we've been able to work a little bit at the gym. The governor kind of allowed 30% opening. So you've been able to do a little bit here and there, you know, meeting up with people when, you know, the gyms were closed, you know, staying six feet apart and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, as long as uh, for a while there, it, I didn't work out as much as I should have been. I was running. You know, I'd work out two or three times a week, where as before I was going four to six times a week, still trying to get some in, but you know the motivation wasn't there. The gym wasn't open. Uh, no one was there to push me as well. I like to push myself, but it's a lot easier with people. Um, but no, we're, we're slowly allowed to open a little bit now. It's it's a little easier. Uh, more people coming in the gym. You know, still staying under that thirty percent range, but getting different training partners and I've been kind of reaching out to cross train as well. Oh, that's wow. yeah, that's always helpful. Just getting new experiences too with them cuz you know, you roll with the same people in the same gym all the time. You're going to kind of all right, well, you're going to pull guard, you're going to go for this sweep, but you go to a new gym, it's a whole new different style of rolling. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So, you're training right now. Right. But what is what is it like training when you're just regular training or when you're training for a fight? Uh, see, I like that question. Uh, a lot of people don't understand the differences between fight camp and regular training. You know, once you're regular training, you, you're in a you're in a routine. You're, uh, you know, I'm going to train this day. I'm going to do this. You're keeping your cardio up, but you're working a lot of technique as well. Whereas fight camp, you're still working technique, still kind of sharpening your tools, but it's a lot of cardio and it's a lot of mental pushing as well. We've had times where uh, we we're going through fight camp. We've had people leave because mm. they you know this is i was under i started fighting under 18 i was i had my first fight at 14 oh wow uh kept going i think i was about 15 through this fight camp and uh the the two people left and they were like well yeah that's really harsh mm. you shouldn't do that to them but i mean it's what you sign up for you have to get that mental aspect of training in there as well as physical in order to get that edge so starting out at 14, what led you to start fighting at 14? Uh, honestly, I, I started training when I was eight. Okay. My sister got into it. She, you know, we were looking for, she's going into middle school, so we wanted some self-defense. And she was like, well, that sounds cool. Let's do it. And so my parents were like, do you want to do it? Mm -hmm. it? Sounded cool to me. You know, it's fighting. So it's like, sure. Uh, I got into it, started training in the kids' class, you know, started moving up through the ranks, started rolling with higher levels, rolling with adults. And, uh... I think I was somewhere between eight and ten. I started. I watched my first fight. My dad fought too, mm -hmm. uh, but this was before that. You know, I, I would watch teammates fight uh, just because he trained with them, and I was like, "Well, this is what I want to do." And uh, as soon as I turned fourteen, uh, my instructor was like, "Hey, do you want to fight?" And I was kind of dumbfounded at the moment, but I said, "Yeah." My parents were cool with it, so signed everything that we needed to and went into it wow that's amazing that's amazing yeah, yeah. so um you actually are um your parents they own a gym what is that so like you're business minded right so how many businesses do you guys have as a family uh as of now one my mom used to run a cake business uh nothing like out of a store or anything but she would she'd make tons of cakes a week i think the most cakes she made at one time, she'd run like Christmas specials and stuff. She made like 35 cakes in mm. a matter of like two or three days. But uh, other than that, you know, we have the gym. Um, that's really the only business we have right now, but that in itself is worth five businesses. Exactly. I agree. I agree. So um, I want to actually bring this up. So Elias Briley, in one of my interviews um, with Let's Talk Sports, he actually talked about how like, no martial artist can truly master uh, an art, a martial art. Right. So, like, was there ever, like, um, a certain style that you felt like you perfected, but then you found out that you didn't? Uh, I've never really felt like I've never, per uh, I've never felt like I've perfected anything. I'm going to re rephrase my statement. Um, 
you know, you feel like you get better and better. And like I said earlier about the cross training and stuff, you go to a new gym and you roll with somebody who's, you know, the same level as you, but you're not used to the rolling style and you're like, wow, I have a lot to work on. Um, you know, I like the, I like that you can't master anything mm. because I like progress. Okay. I don't ever want to be at the very top. There's always going to be someone better. Okay. But if you're at the top, you can't see, you know, I'm getting better now. You can't keep track of your progress in comparison to others you have to see your progress for yourself and say you know maybe i can keep up with this person now or you know i can beat myself a year ago something like that just always seeing that gradual progress is something that i like to see okay so interesting so has there ever been a time where you were in a, a match mm -hmm. and you felt like there was a guy who could have been better than you and then you had to adjust to win a fight Oh, all the time. It's Fighting is about adjusting to your situation. You can't, you know, they, they talk about these fighters having styles. Obviously, uh, the most prominent one you see, Conor McGregor, has his own style. Mm -hmm. You know, you think Conor McGregor, you think his outlandish way of sparring that works. But you have to adjust to your opponent. Every fight you have, you know, you want to train for everything, train for every situation. But at the same time, you know, my opponent's a good wrestler. I have mm. to adjust, I have to adapt to his takedowns. My opponent likes uh, throwing heavy hooks, heavy hands. I need to, you know, avoid those, stuff like that. You have to train yourself to avoid that. And then, same thing kind of mid-match, too. I mean, I've, I've been in a fight where I had a, I had a game plan. Uh, I was fighting Jacob Ashley. Okay. My game plan was keep it standing. He was a purple belt. I think I was, I think I was a blue belt at the time, and... I was like, all right, I need to keep this up. He's going to be good on the ground. I need to keep this standing. As soon as I got hit, I was like, well, i got to go to the ground now. And, you know, you just have to adapt like that. I ended up losing that fight because of that decision. Wow. Yeah, because, you know, I, I, it wasn't a momentary panic, but when he hit, I saw an opportunity, and, you know, I was too stubborn to go against that. But, you know, there, there's negatives to it as well. So what do you take from wins and losses? How do you learn and grow from that? Uh, you got to take lessons from each one. Okay. You can't, you can't be complacent with a win, and you can't be down on yourself about a loss. It, I've lost four times in my career, and each time doesn't feel better than the last. It, it always, it's a very sucky experience. But from those losses, you capitalize on what you messed up on, what you can fix, and you move forward with that. As opposed to win, if you win, you can still look back on that fight. Back to earlier, nobody can perfect the art. You look back on your fight and think, all right, I can improve here. I can, you know, adjust this aspect of my game. Uh, where do I want to go next? Stuff like that. I got you. I got you. So Andre Ward, um, do you, are you familiar with Andre Ward? I don't believe so. No. Andre Ward is an Olympic uh Boxing champion, he was uh, undefeated for a while. Right. Um, he actually no, he's undefeated. He was undefeated. He's, oh, he's wow. going to be a Hall of Fame boxer, and um, he trained his whole life as a boxer. But there was a point in his career um, when he was going to be an Olympic champion, when he was going to be joining the Olympics. Uh, but he, in the back of his mind, he was like, "Man, I've done this my whole life. I'm I'm tired of it." Yeah. Did you ever feel like? You know, you were just tired of the sport and, like, what kept you going? Did you ever have that experience? Um, actually, yeah. Uh, after, I think it was my first loss. I had went five fights without losing my first loss. Again, it was Jacob Ashley. I was just, uh, I was perplexed. I didn't know what to do, where to go. And, you know, at one point, I contemplating. I was like, you know, is fighting even for me anymore? But, uh... You know, I talked to some people about it, my mom being one of them. Uh, just, you know, the nerves building up. And it wasn't like a big, you know, I want to stop fighting, but it's just uh, I talked to him about, you know, the likes and dislikes of fighting. I talked to my dad about it. I talked to my friends about it. Just, you know, what I like about it, what I dislike. And I realized that the likes outweighed the dislikes. I realized mm -hmm. that it was that loss that kind of got me in that bad mindset. Interesting. So what is your why? Why, why do you fight? Uh, I have a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, one, obviously, being the thrill of it. Uh, on the other end of that, there are the nerves that yeah, you yeah. Know, they, those don't dissipate. Whether you Facts. know you're going to beat your opponent, no doubt, or whether you've got this top opponent, you know, champion, been champion for a while, the nerves are going to be the same either way, no matter what show you're fighting in. 
Uh, that's just my perspective. But uh, it's, it's very thrilling. It's the most exciting thing I believe I've ever done. Um, wow. Each time I've stepped in, I've fought ten times. Each time more exciting than the last. Um, I like making new friends, meeting new people. Uh, you know, I wouldn't have met everybody in here. I would have met, you know, everybody in Virginia Beach. And then, uh, you know, everybody around me, too. I, I want to give people someone to look up to. I want to be a role model. And fighting, not just fighting, but my actions through fighting wow. are a good way to do that. And I can see that, man. Like, on your social media, uh, you're very positive. You know, where does that positivity come from? Um same thing just everybody around me you know it's i've got an insane support system uh not just everybody at my gym which everybody there supports me win or lose but you know friends family you know even I, i've got people at the gym that'll you know pick on me if i lose they'll pick on me a little bit but it kind of builds me up but just everybody there sheds a positive light on anything and it kind of rubs off on me and so i can spread it a little bit further to other people I got you. I got you. So, like, at the end of your career, when somebody says who Tommy Kazi is, what do you want people to say who Tommy Kazi was? Um, I want them to say that Tommy Kazi was a good guy. I want them to say that he was a uh, great fighter. You know, um, that's a hard question. I want them. I, I want to leave a mark. I want them to say I was somebody who was rememberable, somebody who they can look up to, somebody who they can mimic. Somebody they can take something from mm. rather than, you know, he was a fighter, he did this, the end. I want them to take something from my life, from my experiences, and maybe use that in their own life. I got you. I got you. All right. My, la my, my one last question is, do you have a top five mixed martial arts all-time list? Who is it? I, I've put very little thought into this, but I got to think on this. Um, honestly, I, I don't know a top five. Top five. Yeah, I. Top five that you watch. So, top five that, that you that like. I've watched. That um, you like. How about that? Top five that you like. Okay. I'm gonna go. My number one right now, just because she's mowing through everybody, is Amanda Nunes. Ooh. Everybody respect. that gets thrown at her, just mowing through them. What she did to Chris Cyborg, I was. I was Total stunned, shot. which she's my second one because again, most people she gets thrown, she mows through them, and she's super nice. Like you, oh, you wow. see Cyborg, you see who she's talking to. Uh, I'll never forget. I mean, you, you put hashtags, people are bound to like your pictures. But she liked one of my pictures and I, like fangirled for a second. Oh wow! Yeah, um, but no, she's like she's a pretty nice person. She's spreading positivity and everything. Uh, I really like Cowboy Cerrone too. His fighting style is cool. He, you know, he's there to bang, but at the same time, he's he's there to fight. You know, he he's in love with fighting. He's not in love, you know, with the glory of fighting, with the fame of it. He wants to fight, wow. and I like that a lot. Um, let me think on this. Uh, this is a hard one. <laughs> I like Cody Garbrandt simply okay. because he he likes to stand and bang. He's I, solid. I like that a lot. He's you know, solid. he he's not gonna run away from the opponent in front of him. He's there to stay he's gonna throw with you whether he gets knocked out or whether he knocks you out he's gonna stay till the very end okay and for my last one i think i'm gonna have to go with shevchenko Interesting. just because her her style her stand-up style it's so straightforward it's it's nothing too complex she's gonna be in your face but at the same time you throw a punch she's over here you know, she's she's everywhere. She's, you know, her game is Muay Thai. Yeah. And I, I myself, I, I love Muay Thai. I love jujitsu too, but it's it's cool to see just a straight Muay Thai fighter. You know, everybody's got a little mix. She has, she has a little mix too, but you see Shevchenko, you know her for Muay Thai. I got you, I got you. Um, you said one of your favorite uh, fighters was Cowboy Cerrone, mm -hmm. right? Cowboy Cerrone is interesting to me because... Um, He's a solid dude. Mm -hmm. He's solid, but it just seems like some of the fans, man, they just want to. They want a piece, man. Yeah. They want to test the waters. The, I remember there was one time the Joe Rogan show, and he was talking about there was two incidents where one dude just punched him in right. the face. I think it was at Target or Walmart or something, mm -hmm. and then some. He was like at a beach party with his friends, and some drunk guy was jealous. You know what I mean? Yeah. And he was just trying to like fight him, and then he like 
tried to go after his girl, and then, you know, yeah. Cowboy Cerrone handled that. Right. He right. handled it. You and got to. You got to. So, like, as a fighter, have you ever dealt with anything like that? And if you were today, how would you deal with it? Uh, I think, well, hopefully a little better than I did back then. I was... I was young at this point. I might have been like 13 years old, still in like middle school. Uh, my fr- a friend and I were walking through Walmart, and you know, a bunch of people in the town knew I did MMA and stuff. And he came up to us and he was like, "Hey, you're uh, you're Tommy." And I was like, "Yeah." He said, "You do martial arts?" And I was like, well, "Yeah." And his next question was, "You think you could take me?" I- I'd never met this man. Like he was maybe a year or two older, so I figured he knew of me, went to the same middle school or something. Um, but I just kind of stood there, shocked. I was like, oh, not, I, I don't know you. Why, get to meet you? Um, luckily, Jazz was there, and he wasn't as dumbfounded as I was. And he was like, uh, we don't typically do that. Our instructor was, uh, you don't use martial arts unless you need to type person. Which I agree with. Even now, uh, don't use it unless you need to. Mm. I mean, if the situation arises, obviously, you have that opportunity. You have the skill set. Um but being a martial artist that also comes with limitations as well. Okay. You know, you don't want to, especially at the professional level, mm-hmm. you know, with Cowboy Cerrone, word got out with all of that. Um, you don't want to put a beat down on somebody. You don't want to go in, you know, you punched me, so now I'm going to demolish you because even though it's the right thing to do, that's going to put a bad mark on your name mm. as an athlete. I can. Could- well, it just well, it just depends too. Like, even though it's a bad name, look at guys like Conor McGregor, yeah, Floyd Mayweather. Like, they kind of like use that negativity to make money. They do. You know but what at, I mean? At the same time, that's that's why I don't like those fighters. Okay. So I think uh, they're more of a any spotlight is good spotlight. Interesting. I don't feel that way. I I don't know. I, I like good publicity, not bad publicity. I respect that. I respect that. I still like. I like Floyd. Floyd's Floyd's my favorite. Boxer oh, they're great boxer. fighters. They're you know great I mean? fighters. There's no denying that. But but I do recognize what you're saying because um I was talking to my boy Adrian Soto Perez. Yeah, yeah. And I just noticed how like especially in the um lo- in the local mixed martial arts community, especially in the Spartaca Fight League. Right. I noticed how like respectful some of the fighters were. Like why why is it you know it's funny because it's like some people from the outside looking in it's like oh yeah i'm a fighter i'm a i'm a kick ass or yeah. whatever but it's like there's a, a certain level of peace of posture that you guys carry where does that come from um i think in part you know to each other uh it's because we've shared the ring even if it wasn't with each other we all know what that's like we know how it feels we know how it feels to be hit in the face with those little gloves we know the feeling of victory, the feeling of loss, uh, and we all share those experiences, and I think that's why we respect each other more. But I think largely it comes from confidence in knowing that if the situation arises, you can do something, mm-hmm. but you know, you're know, you also hoping that it doesn't arise. I got you, I got you. So I always, I'm always going to ask this question. It's going to be mixed martial arts versus boxing. Do you enjoy boxing? I do enjoy boxing. Okay. So I always ask, if you were to pick a sport, obviously you pick mixed martial arts. But mm-hmm. why is mixed martial arts, from your perspective, better? Or is boxing equal? So I've actually thought a lot about this question. I think they're equal. Okay. Personally, I chose mixed martial arts because it's more. You know, mm-hmm. you, you get to do a wider range of things. But, you know, I thought of an analogy. It's... It's like tools. You know, okay. boxing, you sharpen one or two one or two tools, whereas mixed martial arts, you got five, six, seven tools on the right. table that you have to take care of. The five, six, seven tools aren't going to be taken care of as much. You can sharpen them, take care of them. They can be clean, but the person with only two, mm-hmm. they're going to take way better care of them because they only have two. Right. So same thing with boxing versus MMA. You know, a boxer... A lot goes into boxing. I'm not saying that it yeah, doesn't yeah. because, you know, I go to a, a boxing gym in Danville, Lux mm-hmm. Boxing Gym, and uh, he'll pin me up against a boxer, and it's a whole new world. It, there's so much that goes into it. But at the same time, you just sharpen boxing. Right. Whereas MMA, you have to sharpen boxing, Muay Thai, Jiu Jitsu. Mm-hmm. There's so much that goes into it. Right. Um, so, like I said, personally, I chose MMA because there's more of a variety of things. 
I like kicking. Yeah, that, yeah. That's, that's pretty fun. I like, uh, I love groundwork. It's, right, right. It's at times peaceful as well, which I like that about it. Um, but yeah, I, I think they're about equal in terms of the sport. I feel you. I feel like the history of boxing, I love boxing. I grew up a boxing mm-hmm. fan. Um, one of the things I noticed about boxing is, is just for me the concentration of it. Like yeah. they're like weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, they're you know what so I mean. Pinpointed. It's like a licensed weapon that box exactly. your fists are. So it's like, as a mixed martial arts, is there anything like licensed? Like you're more tell you different things. Do you, are you like a licensed weapon? Uh, I think that determines uh, that depend not determines that de- depends on the fighter. Okay. You know we were talking earlier about Shevchenko, mm-hmm. Muay Thai is her thing, punches and kicks. I think more so kicks. Or Holly Holm, she's a, she's a kickboxer. Yeah, she was a boxing I, champion too, wasn't she? I think she, she was. was. Yes, yeah. but I think she's, she's more known for that kickboxing, especially after she came up, fought Ronda Rousey, and knocked her out. Bro, that shocked everybody. But she's known for those kicks. So I think it really depends on the fighter, and that's, that's why I like to train everything because I don't want to become known for one thing. Okay. Uh, I don't, you know, if you're known for groundwork, then we're like, all right, take down defense, stand up. That's what we're going to work. Work some ground so you know what to defend, but we're going to work on his weaknesses. Mm. Same thing with stand up, you know, take it to the ground. So I like to, I like to work a little mix of things just to, just to keep him guessing. I think so far I've presented myself as more of a ground fighter. Okay. But, uh, you know, that's just because the situation arises. You know, like we talked earlier about adapting. I've had plans to stand up for fights, but uh, takedown showed an opportunity. So I was like, okay, why not? Mm. So would you rather take someone down or just straight up knock them out in a fight? Um, I, I like both, honestly. Okay. I love both. You know, you take them down. Punches still happen on the ground, mm-hmm. but a lot less frequently. Whereas right. standing up, you're focused on punching and kicking each other, face, body, elbowing, knees. Um, I personally haven't gotten a knockout yet. Oh, wow. But, you know, the goal's there. I've been working on that, trying to increase my power. That's, uh, my lifting plan is specifically to build power. Not to build that much mass, but to build power in punches and kicks. I got you. I got you. So, okay, we were talking about Holly Holmes and, um, and Ronda Rousey. Who are your, if you had to make a list of, like, your top three unbelievable matches that you've ever seen or, like, you thought a fight a fighter was gonna win, but they lost. What were your top three like? Oh my gosh, uh, fights that you've seen, personally. So this the first one. Uh, I was actually thinking about this one the other day. The first one isn't in the UFC. Uh, you know, Preston Hawker, the pastor okay. of disaster. Oh wow! I forget who he was fighting, but you know, the odds look stacked against the other guy. Yeah, I had never met him at the time. This is my first time meeting him, and I was like, oh, this, this should be a good fight, but the odds look stacked against him. Wow. And uh, first round was about even. Second round, he came out and won it with a choke. Uh, you you would have never expected him to have that behind him, but he's a really good fighter. Mm. And knowing that now, you know, you see like, you're able to compare a little better. Um, who's my other ones? Yeah, the Holly Holm and Ronda Rousey. No one expected that. No one did. I didn't. Uh, let's see. Chris Cyborg, Amanda Nunes. We talked about yeah. that earlier. Yes. Um, I think... This one wasn't really a surprising outcome. I forget okay. who he fought, but a while back, Ro- do you remember the fight? Robbie Lawler, he got his lip busted like here, and it was like split. What? Oh, okay. I forget who he fought, but it was a five-round brawl. Um, the name escapes me at the moment. What? I can't think of it, but it was wild. Like, it, it was intense. I feel you. I feel you. Well, the one thing I, I, I respect about like UFC and mixed martial arts <laughs> is like the diversity of it. Yeah. So you have the peaceful... Calm, good natured people. Then you have like the people who are like brass, but like you also have like the people who are like chill. They smoke weed. They do whatever. Yeah, yeah. Like Nick Diaz and Nate. I heard Nick, you know Nick Diaz. I think is training for a fight. Is he? He is. I think he's training for a fight. It's been a long time coming. Ooh. You know what I mean? And I remember watching some of those uh, Nate Diaz uh, fights on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And I tell you, the, the slot, the Stockton slap. It's so disrespectful. <laughs> it's so disrespectful. Okay, what would you do if somebody did a Stockton slap? I walk you? out the cage. You, you walk out the you cage. You can't fight anymore. Someone slaps you in the face mid fight. You cannot fight anymore. You got to relinquish any titles you have <laughs> and walk out. Okay. I mean, 
I, that's how you'd feel anyways. I, I'd feel terrible if someone slapped me. If you win the fight, you didn't win the fight. Wow, that's it's, crazy. I mean, it's mentally. If I walked out of that cage with a win, but knowing that my opponent <laughs> slapped me in the face instead of punching me, I'd be disappointed that night. Really? I'd be sad. I'd be in the shower, like, curled up, and I'd be like, man, you really slapped me. What if you knocked him out, though? Would you still feel that way? I think so. Interesting. Like, I mean, respect to him for doing it. Like, I, I could never. I could <laughs> muster up the strength. And to those who have been slapped, you know, you're still great fighters. Yeah. But me personally, if I was in a fight where, you know, serious, serious injuries could be had, you know, mm. broken bones, knocked out concussions, and someone slapped me in the face. Yeah. I'd feel like less of a man. That's interesting. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. That's interesting. So I want I wanna I wanna continue on the conversation with boxing and mixed martial arts. Right. So in boxing you, you see a lot of um athletes in boxing, they have brain trauma, they don't they don't yeah. operate the same. Um in mixed martial arts you you still haven't seen mm-hmm. the same amount of uh body injury. But even though UFC mixed martial arts is a new sport, do you still do you feel like there will be in the future you'll see more mixed martial arts who are potentially damaged or hurt and how how long how do you plan on that injuries and stuff like that um i think uh, i think it's always going to be relevant to the sport whether it's boxing any combat sport really you know they just introduced bare knuckle boxing stuff like that yeah yeah um i think it's always going to be relevant to any combat sport um you know, it's just a risk you have to take. If you're truly in love with the sport, you have to know that that's a possibility. And, you know, you, you think that over. You never go into a fight thinking, I'm going to come out of this safe. You know, you I, every, before every fight, I always pray for safety. Not just for me, but, you know, for everyone fight that night. Just, you know, just you, you want to come out safe, but you never know that that's going to happen. Um, I think the refs right now are taking good precaution and stopping fights. You know, people say, oh, they stopped it too early. It's rare that they stop it too early, unless one punch is thrown and they stop it. Okay. Uh, most of the time, not all the time, most of the time, the refs know what they're doing. You know, they, they see, you know, say it's five punches. I mean, normally that's too short, but if they're five haymakers to the face and you're right. not defending, why risk a sixth one? That's interesting. You know, and from a fighter's standpoint, you know, I, I wouldn't want it to be stopped if I was right. in that situation. Yeah. But looking from the outside, uh, just seeing, you know, you, you can see in a fight, but you watch the video and you truly see, you know, what happened, why they stopped it. <clears throat> uh, there's some fights, if you lose by a decision, yeah. you're like, you know, I won that. But you go back and watch the video and it's, uh, no. So I have I have two examples <clears throat> of that. So the first one is Deontay Wilder. So Deontay Wilder, uh, he faced Tyson Fury, mm-hmm. and his trainer threw in the towel. Right. Okay. Deontay was furious. He basically fired the guy. Yeah. He fired him, and he and he was actually a great fighter himself. He was a good fighter himself. Mm-hmm. Back in the eighties, he was pretty good. He was fired for that because he was like, "Look, I, I put my my life on the line yeah. for this. You're not gonna make that decision for me." Yeah. And then there was another situation where. Um, a ref. This was the Henry, Henry Cejudo versus Dominic Cruz fight. Yeah. Did you see that fight? I didn't see it, but I heard a lot about it. So in that fight, um, it was really interesting because Cejudo had a few of those licks that you were talking about, unanswered yeah. punches, several of them. But Dominic Cruz felt like he should have. They should have kept the fight going. Right. So my question to you is, how much responsibility goes into the fighter, the ref? But also the trainer as well into saying, "Hey, look, maybe I should stop this fight. Right? Maybe I no, or maybe no. I know him. We need to keep it going. Like if you're a trainer, or if you're a fighter, depending on certain situations, how do you? How would you handle that? What do you think? Uh, honestly, it just depends on how severe it is. Uh, so myself, in a fighter's perspective, is my responsibility to protect myself at all times. The ref will tell you before the fight, protect yourself at all times. So if you hit the ground and you've got five, six, seven unanswered punches, that's on you. You know, it's it sucks to say, but it's on you. You need to protect yourself, and sometimes you can't, which is why the ref is there. The refs, uh, a lot of responsibility falls on them. You know, I, I'm not a fight ref, but I ref for U.S. grappling. Oh, wow. Yeah, so 
it's not as severe, but you know, you gotta, you always have to be watching. You always have to be, you know, uh, this submission could break their arm. You know, I gotta watch their hands to see if they're tapping. Uh, just stuff like that, you know, especially, I haven't, you know, I, I'm not refing the kids at U.S. Grappling yet, but with adults and stuff too, you know, the, the responsibility falls on them, mm. but at the same time, I need to watch and be sure that they are tapping, you know. Um, the same thing with fighting, you know, with corners and, uh, you know, coaches and stuff, a little bit of responsibility falls on them as well, you know. Mm. I I would ask the fighter, but if it's too severe, you know, it's just a... They've been getting beat for two rounds. It's a miracle they're still even up. They they haven't landed a punch. You know, maybe then be like, ah, uh, maybe I should call this. You're delirious right now. You've taken too many shots to the head. Maybe I should call this. You know what? I'm be honest with you. I'm I'm gonna go back to movies with this. This kind of reminds me of Rocky IV, the opening scene when Apollo Creed had the, oh, the you yeah. know what I mean, where he had the face. I forgot the brother's name. They just had a movie. Ivan Drago. Ivan Drago. Yeah, Ivan Drago. My dad's a big Rocky fan, so. And so it was like it was like he was like throw it. He's like he was like throw a towel, and he was like no no. But before that, he was like, I'm gonna keep fighting. Yeah. He was getting lit. So I just I just you're right. I think the responsibility goes to the trainers. Right. You know what I mean. At the end of the day, yeah he he's put his he or she mm-hmm. has put their life in the line really for this. I mean mm-hmm. when you get in the ring. Anything can happen. Right, there you there never are know. deaths that happen. There was, uh, there was like two or three boxers that died in the ring. Yeah. Um, there was Conor McGregor's friend that passed away in the ring. Yeah. Um, but I just think, hey, look, even though you know you're you as an athlete, you as yeah. a fighter, you put yourself in that situation. Your your trainer knows you. They mm-hmm. know your body. They know, they know when you've had enough. Yeah. And I feel like. As a trainer, you gotta look and be like, you know what? We gotta wait for another day. Yeah. You know what I mean? Cause it's like it's longevity. It's not only about how long you can fight for the next fight, but it also is make sure you can go home. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I definitely agree with you. It's the responsibility of everyone, the fighter, yeah, the trainer, and the ref. Because yeah. everybody needs to go home. Yeah, everybody holds the share of responsibility. I mean, whether the fight stopped by the trainer or the rep, the fighter is gonna be bitter at first. But you know, they, unless you're just not a good person, you eventually learn to be like, okay, you know, that's why this fight was stopped. I need to fix this. Try again another day. Mm-hmm. Now I will say this: I don't want the fighter to just quit and say no mas. No, no. I think what the fighter should do is maybe get a, give out hints to the trainer and be like, I can't see. In one eye. Yeah. Well, I can't. You know what I mean? That way the trainer can know what's going on. Right. Because if, if um, especially in boxing, I wonder, I want your, your perspective on this. Mm. In boxing, if you get one loss, you're negotiating contract. Mm-hmm. It, you, can, you can get a hit. You right. can lose money. As a professional, mixed martial arts fighter, mm. is that the same thing that happens in MMA? Like, how, you know, how is it like with wins and losses? So I haven't. I've I've only had the one professional fight, mm-hmm. so I haven't had a lot of experience with that. Um, and I guess I guess it would really depend on who you're signing the contract with. Uh, I feel like a lot of promotions run it differently. You know, you're going to get a different cut for showing up to weddings. You're going to get a different cut for fighting, and then you get your winner's bonus, uh, stuff like that. And you know, like um, you know, the portion of the ticket sales. So that all goes into it. But I feel like. Mm. Yeah, I guess it really just kind of depends on the promotion. Mm. Yeah. I got you. I got you. My last question to you is, man, what kind of advice would you give to an amateur fighter who wants to sign to a management team or promotion? What's the best way he or she should handle that, especially if they have years of experience yeah. in fighting? What kind of advice would you give as a professional? Um, I'd say definitely be cautious. Like, do you, do your research, okay. essentially, you know? I I currently don't have a management team, mm. uh, but I went pro. But I I knew who I was going pro with. They're actually the same show I started on originally, so I knew they were legit. I knew I was going to have a legitimate opponent. I knew that they were going to show. I knew that you know there, you see some shows, especially as an amateur. Uh, I knew with one show they'd have twenty two fights lined up, and then what? Well, yeah, then within like the week it was like oh yeah we're down to sixteen. 
Wow. So I, I knew there wasn't going to be any of that within this show. They're, they're legit. I fought for them four times as an amateur, and each time my opponent showed up, mm. everything was run super professionally and smooth. It's yeah. fight night challenge. Okay. But, um, you know, definitely do your research. See who you're signing with. See what the deal is. You know, read your contract. Don't just sign because you're too eager to become pro. Just definitely sign. You know, if, if one if someone offered you a professional opportunity, there's bound to be another one. Wow. You know, you're you're obviously at that level. You just have to expand yourself, go out a little bit and explore. Don't don't rush things. Take Got your it. time with it because once you make that step, there's no going back. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Tommy, for uh, joining the sports cycle. Thank we you. We appreciate you, man. I appreciate y'all having me. You're listening to 105.1 Live. This is The Sports Cycle.